Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Grant Cameron, and I have another experiencer story that I want to share today. Um, I saw an interview with Kevin Briggs. I was absolutely fascinated with his story. It is a classic um, experience with uh, whatever this intelligence is behind the phenomena. He's interacting with it. And as I've said numerous times, until you talk to the people who are interacting with the consciousness behind the UFO phenomena, we aren't going anywhere. We're never going to figure it out. You got to talk to these people. They're being ignored. And so I've got Kevin Briggs on today. He's an author who specializes in consciousness, which is my favorite topic, and the connection to ET UFOs. He recently published a book, which is titled Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey, which covers 57 years of his experiences of ET contact. So he's ahead of me. I've only got 47 years. So um, <laughs> Kevin speaks to many groups and he has spoken to the free group. So uh, Kevin is, uh, I think, originally from the UK. He's now in Florida. And that is where the Edgar Mitchell uh, Free Foundation is. And uh, he was a keynote speaker in Miami at the Free Consciousness and Contact Experiencer Conference a couple of years back. I think it was two, yeah, July 2019. Um, I've been friends with Ray Hernandez. I actually have a very interesting synchronicity. I had an awakening consciousness experience that happened February the 12th. 2012 Ray's awakening experience with the dog happened the very next week so I wow. don't think there's any chance and when he first had his experience um, he realized that when he talked he, he called the one down with his where he was standing waiting to do these parking tickets for this guy or these court proceedings or whatever and uh, then he realized he could actually interact he could actually call this thing in and he started to look around for uh, he realized there was a consciousness interface to this thing, and he found me, and um, he um, he met me, and I met him. Was in Florida. I was speaking there, and it was there where uh, Ray told the story. And it was a couple days after that lecture of consciousness. That's when he had this experience where he was taken from his car, and he was shown this wheel with all the the different modalities on it and stuff like that. So Ray and I have this bizarre little synchronicity. Uh, we link up the same as Chris Bledsoe, who's a very famous experiencer. His awakening experience with the uh, what they call the Lady and Light occurred a couple of weeks after Rays. So you have these events that happen sort of in um, in uh, sort of one after another, and you start to realize this stuff all may be connected. Now Kevin is also a co-author with Melissa Kennedy and Edgar Yohi of the recently published book Tap Into Universal Energy, which I may want to ask him a little bit about. Uh, understanding cosmic energy and consciousness. So I'm really thrilled to be talking to Kevin. How are you doing, Kevin? And thank you for uh, quickly offering to talk to me. And uh, I'm excited to hear and share your story with the people who watch my channel. Well, hi, God. Thank you for asking me to be on your show. Uh, without people like you, I can't get my message out. So uh, it's important to, uh, uh, with people like you, without Without you, I wouldn't be here, as it were, and I wouldn't be able to get that message out. So I should be thanking you for having me uh, <laughs> to have a voice. Thank you very much. I, I guess we could go right there, right to the the thing where um, when I had it, when I first had the experience, and you you can correct me if it, it was different with you, but when I had the first experience, you think it's a random experience. You think, wow, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time. And the more I go along, the more I realize this whole thing may have been planned. This this is something that is not as random as people think it is. And I think you have this experience that this goes right through your life. Like we we always, when I was first uh, had my experience was 1975. And that was the same year that Travis Walton was taken, the same year. And we believed it was random. And then when I started to look back, I go, no, no, this, this was, this is almost like it was planned that I got dragged into this. So let's go uh, through this whole idea that that if you're an experiencer, you're usually a lifer. It's like, um, you know, you you start going back because a lot of people say to me, they'll say, well, you know, I had a, I, I think I just have dreams about them. I don't, I don't think I've been abducted. I just have dreams. Then I say, anything weird happened in your life? Oh, yeah. They start telling me all these stories. So let's start you that sort of the background of, of, you know, your life experiences and how this thing sort of woke you up and, and, and put you on the path. Okay. It's, it's a long story, but I'll come back to it as much as I can. Because uh, we're talking about consciousness, which is really the uh, modality of contact with all this that brings it all together, which is what Ray talks about. 
so my first understanding of being conscious again was when I was three years old. My mother had engaged the photographer to uh, take some photographs for the family album. The photographer arrived. He lifted me up onto our um, oak table, dining table, a higher elevation there. And from that position, I looked around the room and I, I knew that I was conscious energy in a physical body again. And that was at the age of three. So that was really the beginning of my journey. And I, I still remember that to this day. I got a photograph that was taken and uh, I, I saw myself as two, a physical and this conscious energy. The conscious energy was looking out at the surrounding world. It was uh, quite an awakening for me, shall we say. So that was the beginning of it. And then nothing happened until I was eight years old. I was always sensitive to the vibrational frequencies that surround us. Uh, I can uh, sense them, the, the different levels of the vibrations of the frequencies. Uh, so I was aware of that. And then uh, when I was eight, I, uh, I was taking a bath at home and there was a change in the frequency within the bathroom. I looked to my right and two beings appeared. They just materialized. Frightened me to death at the time, as you can imagine, Grant. Uh, but I looked at them, they were speaking about me, not to me. They were speaking telepathically to one another, which I could understand. And I remember, obviously I know these two now, I've interacted with them all my life. Uh, but at that, I didn't know them. And, and there's a first meeting. And there was one male, one female, both extremely attractive, both with long blonde shoulder length hair, wearing deep blue uh, garment, jumpsuit type garments and deep blue eyes. And the female spoke first to the male and she said, is this the boy? And the male said, yes, this is the boy. And then she questioned him again and said, are you sure this is the boy? <laughs> and he said, uh, yes, this is the boy. And I think, anyway, uh, and it went on. And then she said, but look at him, he's small. He's uneducated. He's frightened by our presence. And she was correct. I was terrified. And he said, yes, this is the boy. I will guide him. I will teach him. There was some other conversation within that, and then uh, they left. And as I said, I was frightened to death. I didn't get the bath, I just sat there. The water went cold. Mother came in to see why I was still in the bath. I told her about the two beings, and she said it was just my imagination. And it wasn't, I was still in contact with them to this day. Uh, so that was the start of the journey uh, as an eight-year-old. So you, you've you you've dealt with these beings now. Let, let me clarify the beings. So you've had a number of different beings. These are the first two that you saw and you've seen them through your whole life. So can I ask you the question, uh, you were eight years old at the time, did these beings ever get any older? Or did they always appear to be sort of the same age as That's when you saw question. them? No, they, they still appear just the same now as they were then. Uh, if, but I can communicate now in many different ways. I don't have to physically see them, although I can do if I, if I ask them to, but I can, I can use consciousness itself as the modality for the communication. And I'm sure we all have these abilities. We're just, uh, they're hidden. We're not taught how, how to use them, but I think we all have them. Um, so yeah, um, is, is yeah, there so one change now. Is there, is there one, one being, like you sort of mentioned, is there one uh, being or set of beings that usually interact because I, I, what I've sort of the pattern seems to be that experiences will interact with a lot of different beings, but there's one being or maybe two beings that actually do all the interaction and talking to you and and the training and stuff like that. That's as it is with me. Now, when I was 14, I was introduced to a group of eight beings, which included the first two that was in the bathroom. But it's been and their names are Art D, they're fifth dimensional beings, they're from. Uh, Andromeda, they're Arcturians, they tell me. And they say I'm part of their extended family, only my physical is in the third dimension rather than the fifth dimension. But as I say I was introduced at 14 to a group of, uh, uh, which included those two, a, a group of eight, which I refer to now as a council of eight. And, uh, but it's Orton D that has done most of the teaching throughout my life in relation to consciousness, the higher conscious beings, and all the modalities of contact that they use. And uh, I've, I've experienced them all apart from the near-death experience. And I don't particularly want to experience that one at this moment. In time, so. <laughs> so, so you haven't had the near-death experience because I think the free survey showed that 37% of uh, people who um, have had this experience have had the near-death experience. Have you had the out-of-body experience? Because that's one of the questions I want to ask you about. How physical do you think this really is in terms of 
the engagements that you have? Do you believe this is happening on a physical level, or do you believe that this is like on on a you're being left lifted up to their their uh, vibration and they're interacting you in their world? Yes, uh, I would say simple answer. Yes, it's a multi-dimensional communication, and again, it once we raise our vibrational frequencies and have that understanding of consciousness, how it can be used for communication, travel, healing, creation, and even co-creation with our ET star families. Once we reach that level of understanding, then we are communicating on their level. I'll probably explain a bit later in relation to one of the uh, modalities where I do con communicate with all eight, but I'll only see them as pure conscious energy and they're standing like a semicircle and the conscious energy moves forward, uh, front and center, and then they communicate with me, uh, uh, just like a, a radio wave, I suppose, but it's using conscious energy as the uh, conduit for the communication. But you did mention the out-of-body travel, and uh, yeah, that's one of the modalities of contact I've used all my life. And that started when I was nine years old. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but, uh, or that was the male that appeared in my bathroom at eight, appeared in my home, in my living room, uh, behind the uh, uh, living room curtain. And again, I, I'd have some friends around for the afternoon and they'd often, I showed them out the back door and as I turned back into the house, I could feel this high vibrational frequency in, in the house. So I went looking for it. I went upstairs into the kitchen, into the living room where it was strongest. And I looked behind the curtain and there was an orange orb there about four to six inches across it was vibrating slightly and uh just by, behind the curtain i was a bit concerned because i thought I brought it into the home and my mother would be uh, would chastise me for doing that if, if it was my fault so i was a bit perturbed by it but not frightened and anyway i thought well i'll go to bed tonight it'll be gone in the morning so i got up in the morning and when i woke up i knew it was still there i went downstairs put behind the curtain and it was there uh, to cut a long story short, it was there until Friday. I came in from school about 4.30. I opened the back door and I knew that the orb had left. There was no communication at that time. But what happened then, it increased my psychic abilities and gave me the ability to travel at will outside of my body. And as a child, I would just use it to go and visit my grandparents who lived about 70 miles away in Liverpool. I was in the UK at that time. And I would just relax on a Sunday, open my mind, as I call it, and then travel out of body to their home, go down to the roof. And normally I would sit upstairs in the other dressing room in the master bedroom. And I was sitting there looking down through the floor, which was opaque. And my grandmother would usually cook, cooking in the kitchen on a Sunday. And my grandfather either watching TV or reading the newspaper. So that was my introduction to out of body travel. And uh, oh, clearly I've expanded on that over the years. Uh, and now I'm able to go and communicate with the ETs. Uh, if you call them ETs, I think that's probably the correct, incorrect word really. The higher conscious beings, star families, uh, what, what, I suppose whatever label you want to put on them. But I'm able to go and meet at their level at uh, my request. So uh, that's the level they've taken me to in relation for uh, communication. Talk a little bit about a bit more about that because I just interviewed the um, head of MUFON Japan, and he's done forty um, controlled sessions where he's gone out of his body and interacted with the beings. Can you describe how you would do it and what kind of interactions are you on the ship or or where are you interacting with them and and maybe get into a little bit about the messages. What 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 is this all about in in terms of what they're telling you? Okay, that's a lot of questions I've got. Uh, the, uh, um, the, if, if I explain some of the modalities, okay, so if uh, I want to communicate with them out of body, I can relax, open my mind, go onto the astral plane and meet with them there. And I've very often met with Orton D on the astral plane. I've even met with them on the astral plane when they come, uh, and I believe they're coming down to the astral plane and I'm going up to that level. We're meeting halfway. They, I've even met them on a craft there, and they've invited me on the craft. And when I go onto the craft, I go through the skin, and the skin of the craft is conscious. It's pure, conscious energy. Right. But I go inside the craft, uh, the, all I see is two orbs, and that's Orton and D. We communicate telepathically. On a one occasion, I, and I've met them many times do it using this modality. And on one occasion, I said, 
to see if I understand this correctly. Uh, we are here uh, traveling on the astral plane in a conscious craft that you've created by thought and consciousness. And I see you as a pure conscious energy orb. Uh, they said, yes, that's correct. I said, how do you see me? They said, we see you, Kevin, exactly the same as a pure conscious energy orb. So again, that's one of the levels, one of the modalities of contact using out of body. Uh, another one will be telepathic communication. Uh, very often they'll wake me up and give me some information telepathically. But I've learned over the years that if I'm given information, I always ask for confirmation. I can give you one example out of many. Uh, one day, a few years ago, they woke me up February the 1st at 1, 1, 1 a.m. And uh, there's always some synchronicity, some synchronicity as well. They gave me a telepathic message. And uh, I got out of bed, I walked into my bathroom and uh, I say, I, I do ask for confirmation. So I repeated the message back to them and then said that I can see a street light outside my bathroom window. I said, if this information has come from you and it's correct, can you turn that street light off? And the street light went off immediately. Wow. So I went back to bed, that was my confirmation. In the morning about eight o'clock, it was daylight. They woke me up again by jumping physically on the bed, two of them, okay. <laughs> So I've had them pull my toe as well when I'm in bed to wake me up. So there's, there's, there's physical contact as well. And uh, I, uh, they gave me the second part of the message. So again, I walked into the bathroom. I repeated the whole message, the first and the second part, and it's now daylight. I said, now, uh, to as confirmation that the information has come from you telepathically, can you turn the street light on? And the street light came on immediately although it was daylight. So uh, that type of confirmation. And uh, downloads, when they give me downloads, I'll give you just one quick example. Uh, I was sat by my pool one night and they gave me a download of information about the quantum unified field theory, explaining it to me, how it works with the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force. But they said there's a fifth interaction of force there, and that is consciousness. And your scientists don't fully understand this yet, although their uh, understanding their quantum unified field theory is correct, but they need to include consciousness within their calculations and theories. So when they gave me that information, I just sat by my pool on my own. I said, well, look, you've given me all this information now. I don't know anything about this. I need to know that it's you that's giving me information and it's not just my imagination. Can you show me a craft as confirmation? A craft appeared immediately outside of my pool cage. I went in to get my wife. I said, can you come outside and for this craft, Sam? And so she came out and we went outside of the pool netting area and the craft was there. A second one appeared, third, four, five, seven in total appeared, flew silently over our heads and then uh, changed direction by about 80 degrees and then disappeared sequentially as they had arrived. So that was confirmation for me. And not only for me, but my wife witnessed it as well. So that was good. And then another um, download, again, information about the theory of everything. And uh, they were explaining how uh, non-locality duality entanglement, uh, again, our scientists understanding is correct. However, they again need to use consciousness within there, within their calculations because there's a, a measurement problem within, within those calculations. And if they use, I think they said C as constant as a consciousness within their own equations, then they, they would solve that measurement problem and the measurement problem related to space, time and dimension. Bear in mind, Grant, I know nothing about this and I'm just <laughs> sat there relaxing by my pool. So again, I said, you just give me all this information in the download uh, that I know nothing about. Uh, I really need, can you show me a craft to show me that this information has come directly from you and it's not my imagination. A craft appeared immediately and it just flashed one, two, three times and then disappeared. So that was a confirmation. Uh, again, of the uh, telepathic communication, downloads, using consciousness as a conduit. But when you do that all your life, you become very confident in the information they give you and very confident in the modalities of contact that they use. And uh, I'm able to use, as I say, all of them, really. Uh, and that, but that's been part of the education, part of the training. Uh, and that's where I'm at at the moment, really. And I wouldn't be speaking about, I wouldn't be speaking to you today, Grant, if it hadn't have been about five years ago, 
I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I came back into bed. I was just about to snuggle down. A bright light outside the bedroom window. The light came into the bedroom. It lit it up like a myriad of butterflies, but it was just pure white light. And then Orton D materialized at the bottom of the bed. After pleasantries, I asked them what was the reason for their visit. And they said, Kevin, we want you to talk about your lifelong interactions with us. And we want you to write about it. I said, well, I don't mind talking about it, but I'm not a writer. They said, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you. And we will give you information to include in the book. In fact, Kevin, you will write two books. And we will give you information to be included. So, um, so they did that. And I've written, <laughs> I've written the two books now. So I've done what they've asked me to do. Um, and I'm fascinated now that I've been speaking out for a while now that people are interested. And I did say to Art, I said, but Art, people won't believe me. And he said, Kevin, it doesn't matter whether people believe you or not. What's important is that you tell the story. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Wow. So you, so we, we, we were going into the, the idea of a mission in terms of the fact that you may have signed up for this. And what is the connection, do you think, between you and them? Do you think this goes back? before birth that you sort of agreed to come in and they're playing their little act and role and you're playing your role? I suspect so, yes. I suspect that I agreed to do this and I've come down from the higher vibrational frequencies uh, to this level. I mean, I've, I've visited the higher vibrational frequencies. I'm able to do that. I'm able to connect with our deceased families and friends uh, at will. And uh, I've got some amazing stories that contact I have. In relation to when I was younger, I was uh, oh, about 16 or 17, and I was I needed more information because nobody talked about outer body travel, nobody talked about ETs or higher conscious beings. And I, I used to ask in the third party with family members and friends, saying, Do you know anybody that uh, I've got a friend that travels outside of his body? He tells me when he goes to bed at night, or I can do it during the day if he wants. Do you do that? And they would say, No, 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 it must be delusional or something. So one <laughs> evening I went to bed. And uh, I thought, well, there must be more to this. So I relaxed, I opened my mind. I actually held out my hand and I asked Art. I said, Art, I know there's a lot more information here. I need to learn more. Can you come and show me? He came, he took hold of my hand and uh, I left my body with him. And uh, bear, bear in mind, I'm used to leaving my body on my own, but not with someone else. So I looked down, I could see I was fast asleep. We went out through the window and we just traveled around the subdivision came back in through the window, I saw my body asleep, and uh, I went back into my body. I woke up in the morning thinking, well, that was cool, but I wasn't certain whether it was a dream or it was real. So I thought, I'll try it again this evening. So that evening, I went to bed again, I relaxed, I opened my mind. My mind. I asked Ork to come and show me more. He came, he took hold of my hand, I left my body, I could see it fast asleep. We went out through the window, we flew down into Leeds City Centre, where I worked at the time as a technician at the Leeds University. We flew around the town centre. I saw all the buildings that I recognised, uh, the town hall, the hospital. I said the university where I, where I worked as a technician. Uh, and the people milling about in the streets and things. We came back to my apartment, into the window, and I could see my body asleep. I went back into my body. And then in the morning, I woke up and I was, I still wasn't fully convinced that I wasn't dreaming or sleepwalking or doing something. So I, I tried again on the third occasion and exactly the same routine. But I did say to him, because I was uh, three stories up and I was a bit concerned about going out through the window uh, in case I was sleepwalking or something. So I said to Art, I said, look, I'm happy going traveling with you, but uh, can we go out through the roof instead of the, uh, the window? He said, yes, no problem at all. And I explained why, and we went out through the roof. And then all subsequent journeys with him went out through the roof. And then on one occasion, he came to me and said, Kevin, I'm going to take you somewhere special tonight. Uh, are you happy to go, come with me? I said, yes, I'll go anywhere you want. So I left my body with him. We went out through the roof and we just kept traveling up and up and up. And I saw the earth getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we, uh, we went into a high dimension. And within that dimension, there were 30 people stood in line. At the head of the line was my deceased father, who was standing up when he greeted me. I'd never seen him standing because he was always in a wheelchair from when I was born. So he greeted me, and the feeling of love from him and the whole group was just tremendous, tremendous feeling of love. 
And uh, uh, he said, my father said to me, he said, I'm going to introduce you to your family members going back over 30 generations. And these were all dis deceased family members. And we went down the line. There were so much love emanating from each one. And we got halfway, the first 15 showed me their last physical, their last incarnation, as it were. When we got to the 15th, they were just a pure conscious energy orb, round, slightly vibrating. But I'm I was used to seeing that, both with Ot and D. Uh, so I communicated with them telepathically. And so the last 15 were just pure conscious energy. So really what they were doing with that, they give me the, these experiences. They don't sit me down in a classroom. The experience itself is the lesson in relation to consciousness, the, the different levels of consciousness that we exist at. And down here in the third dimen dimension, we're at a lower vibrational frequency. And that's why we have the physical. But you can leave the physical behind and go and travel outside. So, and I, I used to go and visit with my extended family or deceased, we see deceased family over a two year period. And then I was finding it and I, I got so confident with it, I didn't need to go with the art, I could go on my own. But I was finding it more and more difficult to get back into my body. So I decided one day at work, uh, I would go, I couldn't go back and visit them anymore. But I thought I will go back one more time and just let them know the reason why I'm not going back. So that evening I went to visit them. I told them my reasons I wouldn't be back to see them. They tried to persuade me to stay, uh, but I felt that if I stayed with them then at those higher levels of frequencies, then my physical would die. And I said, I've got things I need to do down there. I'm enjoying my life. And I know you'll be here when my physical does expire. And uh, I look forward to meeting you all again. And I've never been back to see them, but I know that they're there. And then that's just another, another level of communication at uh, uh, using consciousness itself, traveling through the the, the frequencies really. Wow, that, fascinating. You, is, is the, I think the free survey showed that, that a, that a great number of experiencers have met with dead people. You mentioned that. Maybe you can give another example of, do you have people come say after they die? And and what's your psychic level in terms of, uh, you, you probably had it since you were a child, but uh, was there any time when they sort of upped your ability to be psychic and intuitive? I think that started at nine. I think that's when art came into my home and stayed there for a week as that pure conscious energy orb. I think what he did, he activated my DNA. The DNA, I've been told, is just light and it's a frequency and they can activate it as and when they want. And I believe that what art did for that week when he was there, he was activating my DNA. And that increased my psychic abilities, the abilities to travel outside of my body. And yes, you do say that uh, I have uh, uh, d deceased people. I don't see them any different. <laughs> They're just people at a high level of consciousness. And I'll give you a, a, a story, which is quite interesting, I think, because it's someone that someone that is he's well known. I live in the country uh, in uh, Florida, central Florida. Yeah. And I've got five acres. I've got a couple of dogs. I take my dogs out. I enjoy the countryside. Uh, I enjoy the sunshine. And on this occasion, I walked up to my front gate and I'm just stood there admiring everything around me, nature. Uh, just It's just beautiful to be out in nature. And Edgar Mitchell, who passed about three or four months earlier, spoke to me. Wow. And not, unus not unusual for a deceased person to speak to me, but he identified himself and he said, Kevin, I'd like you to convey a message uh, to a friend of mine. I said, yes, who's that friend? She said, uh, he said it was uh, Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle-Wright. I hadn't heard of Dr. Rebecca Hardcastle-Wright. I'd heard of Edgar Mitchell. I'd never met him, but uh, I knew he was the sixth man that landed on the moon because I watched that when I was a child uh, following the Apollo missions and things. So I knew who he was and I knew it recently passed because I've seen it in the news, but I didn't know uh, Rebecca Hardcastle-Wright. And he gave me the message and he gave me information within the message that would uh, um, identify the fact that I'd actually speaking, spoken to him because it was personal to the two of them. And, uh, and then I, I thought, well, I'll have to convey the message. He disappeared, but he attracted my attention, believe it or not, with a rainbow. The rainbow appeared 180 degrees. I looked at the rainbow 
and that's when he spoke to me. But I've learned since then that uh, uh, rainbows are used as portals, they are lights, they are used for communication, and I've had other experiences of that since then. But then I had to decide, how do I convey the message? I don't know this lady. Um, so I spoke to a friend of mine, Dr. Melanie Barton, and she said she's got, uh, who I know, uh, Kathy Marden, and Kathy Marden knows uh, uh, Rebecca Hancock survived. So I was given an introduction by Kathy, and then uh, we connected by email, and then Rebecca phoned me, I gave her the information and everything, and it changed the course of her life. But again, it's like you said earlier, uh, Grant, we've all been brought together uh, for a reason, for a purpose, uh, for, um, we each have a, like, and as I said earlier, piece of that jigsaw. And even though Edgar had left the physical, he uh, was still working towards what he was doing while he was here, which is raising the understanding of consciousness. Uh, that was a lot of his work that he was engaged in. Uh, so it, it's fascinating that they raised me to a level where I'm able to communicate uh, confidently and then relay the information because it's important that we have that level of communication. And since then, Rebecca and I have become friends and uh, uh, she'll repeat the story. She does speak about it. I heard her talk about it on a, on a TV show, but I didn't mention it for many years because I thought it was personal really, but now I see the importance of it in relation to that understanding of consciousness itself. And I believe he was one of the founders with uh, uh, Free as well, I believe. So, uh, uh, and again, that was fascinating. I was asked by one of my guides, go and speak at uh, Ray Hernandez's conference. And uh, I I contacted him and asked him, I, I expected him to say no, and he said, yes, come down and speak. And I did, and again, that's just bringing everybody together, this huge community of people who have got their own contacts, different from mine, but they have their own as well. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's very exciting times uh, that we're in at the moment, uh, where we're growing exponentially, uh, we're changing evolutionary, and uh, we're doing that through consciousness itself. Wow. Uh, what was Rebecca's reaction to the, was she surprised at the message that she you gave from Edgar Mitchell? That's very interesting, that. I don't think she was, no, because <laughs> I suspect, I suspect Rebecca, I, well, I know Rebecca, uh, Rebecca is a lifelong experience as well. And uh, she did tell me that uh, uh, she was aware that Edgar was contacting other people. So wow. she was aware. So she wasn't surprised by it. Um, uh, if you ever speak to her, you'll have to ask her. But uh, uh, yeah. well, I still keep in touch with uh, either a phone or email, mainly email. But uh, And I pass keep costing as well, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've interviewed her and I, I, I've had some contact with her. So, uh, and I knew she was close with Edgar. She was actually um, trying to get Edgar a meeting with uh, John Podesta at the White House. Uh, so yes, he, I remember he, that. Yeah, I remember. So she, she did have that uh, direct contact. Um, in terms of uh, the free thing, you, you mentioned guides. So can you define, are we talking the beings or the do you have guides and um, what would appear to be um, beings that are talking to you? You mentioned the guides. Who are the guides that you're talking about? Okay. Well, I would I would consider all eight of the group of that what I refer to now as the Council of Eight. They're all guides. But the two main guides of teachers are Art and D. Uh, and then there's uh, if I could just describe them, a box I could describe how I met them when I was. 14 years old, and then yeah. I'll give you some idea of who they are. I was, uh, when I was 14, I had a paper round. And uh, every time I left the house to go into the paper round, a UFO would appear uh, directly above me. And then a second UFO uh, would appear, uh, usually from the other direction. And then the two would follow me around the paper round. And then when I finished, one would usually go back in the direction that it come from. And the second one would just go straight up into space. And that was all the time. And while I was doing the paper round, I was aware that there was some people behind the hedge, behind the wall. I could feel the frequencies. Uh, I wasn't frightened, but I knew there was somebody there. And on one occasion, I said, I know you're here. Can you show yourself? Can you come out from behind the hedge, behind the wall? And two small greys appeared. They walked out. I wasn't frightened. And uh, I said, uh, what, what do you want? Why are you here? And they said, there's a group of people that want to meet with you. And I said, well, I've got my paper round to finish. 
and then I've got to go to school. Uh, so, you know, it'll be difficult. I said, well, you can finish your paper round and we'll have you back in time for school. So I said, okay, that's how I agreed to go with them. I finished the paper round and I was taken up to a mothership. And I only know it was a mothership because of the size of the hangar. It was huge. There's all these different crafts in there. The ones that we see that people take photographs of, uh, all different shapes and sizes. And, uh, and I was led down to an, an amphitheater. And the amphitheater was full of beings. And at the bottom of the amphitheater, there was a, a table with eight beings on there. I was uh, guided down to the front. And I thought I was the, there was a, just a human specimen. When I got to the table, I was introduced to each, each of the eight. Ort and D were the first two. Those were my guides that I met in the bathroom. And bearing in mind, I'm 14 now, so it's about six years after that. And then there's Anna. She's a, a small blue avian type bird with a, like a duck beak, uh, very empathic. And then Zach, he's a small grey, he's a mathematician, an engineer. Uh, he has a partner, he's got three offsprings. Uh, I've learned a lot about him over the years and had a, a great deal of contact with him. And then Ra, he's the lead counsel of this age. And he's Anunnaki, very old, very strong energies with him. And then Targ, he was a tall grey. Uh, he's responsible, he told me, for the security, not only for the Council of Eight, but this quadrant of the galaxy. And I never thought of the galaxy being split up into quadrants, but that, that's what he said. And then Chica, I was a little bit surprised by him, a uh, uh, bit intimidated, because he was a mantis being. He was just like a large grasshopper. So I was a little bit perturbed. And the blue bird type being, Anna, she picked up on that and came up and put her arm around me because she felt that I was a little upset by this, uh, this big grasshopper being. And then the last one was Orla. I think she's an astrobiologist, she told me. And she, um, she's a tall white, she has long blonde hair, but the hair is translucent and she's very gray in appearance. Uh, and that was the eight. So I was introduced to all eight and then uh, they took me back home and I got back home about 20, 25 minutes later than normal. But I've interacted with all eight, uh, my life, all my life. And uh, Ra, the leader, he appeared uh, one evening when I was in my 30s at home. I'd come home from work. I'd done what we call a quick changeover shift. I was a police officer in the UK. And you'd finish at 10 o'clock at night, you'd get home. Then you'd have to get up at five in the morning to go and do another shift. But when I came home from those shifts, I was always extremely tired. So I'd go to bed for two or three hours till my wife came home at five o'clock. On this occasion, I got into bed. I'm about to go to sleep. And a shadow being uh, came into the bedroom. Uh, nothing unusual. I've seen them before. And he beckons me. Well, they don't normally do that. They don't normally look at you. And uh, he beckoned me. And I told him to go away. I said, I want interest. I'm tired. <laughs> and he walked out, he walked out through the door. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, he came back again. And he looked at me directly and he beckoned me again. And I said, no, I said, go away, I'm tired. Leave me alone, come back later. He left. He came back a third time. I said, oh, I said, you're so persistent. You obviously want me to show me something. So I got up. I didn't get dressed. Uh, he went back out through the door. I, uh, I opened the door onto the landing. I didn't uh, say I didn't get dressed. And there was a column of light there. And I would describe the column of light as uh, what you see on Star Trek when they beam people down to the planets. It was just like that. And I thought, you've gone to all this trouble to get me here to see this, I'll step into it. So I stepped into the light. And then I heard this voice say to me, uh, I am your father, you are your father's son. Uh, there was nothing else said. And then the light dis dissipated a, a few minutes after that from the, line, from the floor, uh, exactly the same time and disappeared into my chest area or abdomen, just above there. And I felt you absolutely euphoric, euphoric. And uh, I was no longer tired. Uh, I got up, I took my dogs out for a walk. Uh, when my wife came home from work, I told her about it. And we went out that evening for a meal, which I would never do after those quick changeover shifts. But uh, that was Ra himself, the lead counsel again. Uh, and uh, I've actually channeled him uh, in fact, I think I channeled him at the Free Foundation at the conference there, and he spoke uh, to, and it was recorded, so it, it'll be shown sometime, but uh, uh, I'm sure. But, but So those are the group, the eight that I'm in contact with, uh, but as you said earlier, uh, just two that uh, really 
uh, part of the education, so we say, and ought indeed describe themselves as teachers, as um, guides. That's what this, that's how they describe themselves. That's their occupation, as you might say. Hey, hey, you you wrote the the book, the spiritual consciousness and personal journey. Is is all this in there and the other one? All these because this these are incredible stories. I it's fascinating. <laughs> and 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 the well, question would be: Do you journal everything that happens to you? Did you keep a journal? Yes, I do. I do. I've uh, <laughs> I have it in my drawer here. Let me just show you. There you go. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, and I scribble on it sometimes as well. So uh, I don't tend to um, journal it too much now uh, because uh, my journeys change slightly. And uh, and you mentioned the book uh, Spiritual Consciousness, a personal journey. Yeah. Uh, most of those things I've, I've spoken about are in that book, except for the one when I was 14. Uh, that's not in the book there. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, but uh, I don't like saying that one. And then the other one, tap into universal energy, is very interesting because they've now brought my wife into the frame. They oh, communicate really? with my wife. Yeah, they. Uh, one of them, I mentioned Zach earlier. He uh, he moves my wife's personal items around the home. She'll put something down. He'll pick it up and move it somewhere else. Or she'll go and close the blind or open the blind. And then he'll close it or open it, which opposite what she's done. Wow. And, uh, she's, she's, let, let, she's, let me ask about that because I have a I have a book calling uh, coming out on at Ports and Manifestations. It's about to oh, come okay. out, so I'd like to maybe get some details on this. Maybe I can stick it in. So, y have you had the at Ports and Manifestations stuff moving around and disappearing and reappearing? And and your wife, uh, how long has this been going on that she was having these apport things happen? Okay, with my wife only a few years now, but no, I haven't had things disappearing. It's my wife that's had them disappearing. Okay. Although I did lose, I did lose a wallet uh, a while ago now, and I asked if uh, they could manifest it back for me because there were some photographs in there, and two days later it manifested in my vehicle for me. So, uh, but no, <laughs> I, I don't have any uh, airport activities, uh, but my wife. Um, uh, she can tell you about her examples of what happened, but uh, but again, um, they showed her a craft a few. Um, oh, I don't know what date it was now, and uh, the I think I've got the picture in this book of the craft. Okay. But it, but it's interesting. They used the rainbow. She was sat by the pool, and I was in the bedroom. I was just getting up, and uh, I thought I'll just even contact the council of eight and see you know what we're doing. A bit of conversation, you know. And I wasn't able to contact them, but I contacted a craft that was flying past and the, uh, with about seven greys in it. And uh, the pilot of the craft was called Tia. I knew him, I'd met him before. So I said, uh, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, we, we were flying by and we've deviated from our flight path. We wanted to come and see where you lived. I said, oh, okay. So we had a little bit of conversation. And, and then he said, right, we'll have, to, we'll have to go now because as I said, we're off our designated flight path. Nothing unusual for me, it's just normal. And uh, But then I got dressed, uh, I went out to meet my wife, I, I drink my coffee, she's drinking a cup of tea, and she said, oh, you missed the most beautiful rainbow this morning. And again, the rainbow appeared at the back of the house, uh, 180 degrees from ground to ground. I said, oh, did you get a photograph? She says, yes, I got the iPad out, and went and took a photograph. But then she said, you want what happened next? I said, no, what happened next? She said, a craft appeared under the rainbow. I said, did you get a photograph? She says, yes. So I had a look at the photograph and it's a little blurred, it's a craft. But it, what happened was, how she took it, she was taking a photograph of the rainbow because they attracted attention with the rainbow as they did with Edgar Mitchell and me. And I've had a, other incidences of that. And uh, so she lifted the iPad up, set the photograph, took the photograph, put it down, and then the craft appeared. So as she lifted it up, she took the photograph and I said, I would, suspect it was re-cloaking again and she got it in that in that blurred uh, cloak but uh, but the interesting thing was when i looked at the photograph i was communicating with tia and the group of seven graves in the craft at 8 30 on the clock at the side of my bed when i looked at the time on the photograph it was 8 30. Wow. so that was really confirmation of the not only the telepathic communication uh, but including my wife uh, um, within the 
uh, aspects now of what's happening in relation to uh, consciousness and the ETs. And I find it, I find it fascinating because I've got a friend, a friend of mine who's a retired detective from the UK, never lived in ETs, UFOs, adamant, there's nothing like that all his life. And he always just think, he used to listen to what I used to say about the stories and things. Uh, but I think he thought I was delusional, but it's still a good friend. And well, uh, a couple of years ago, there were four of us sat by my pool in Florida uh, and uh, there was his wife, my wife and me. Only. And I went in to get a couple of beers. I reached into my fridge inside the house. As I reached in, I said to my uh, ETs, I said, now will be a good time to show him a craft. You know, he's, I think he was 70 then. And uh, so I took the beers out, put them down on the table. I sat down. No, as soon as I, I had done that, a craft appeared. And it, it moved in a, a erratic manner. It was just uh, at the back of our house, very low down. It moved one, two, three times, and then shot up and then straight up. So, but he saw it and he looked at the three of us. Did you see that? I said, yes. Now, the, I think there's a lesson there because it changed him. It yeah. changed his whole perception from being a total skeptic and denier of ETs and UFOs. Because he saw one, he now he now talks about it. He now sends me articles. And I'll speak, it's just been over again for another two weeks holiday. And uh, uh, he said, oh, Kevin, have you, have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? Oh, I've just, in fact, I phoned him the other day. And he said, I've just watched a, a UFO documentary on Netflix. He said it was really good. <laughs> so, but, but I think the lesson there is, if you count him as one individual, and he changed like that overnight, that's what will happen when globally we accept and see that our ET staff armies are here. They are amongst us. They're here to help us uh, with our evolution help us with our technologies. They will share their technologies with us. And, uh, but we need initially to invite them here and uh, meet with them and then start with that relationship. But I think my friend uh, is a, a prime example. Uh, he was just amazed by it. it. So it shows that just whether he's believing, as they say, uh, he now believes in it, you know. And, and he believes they visited him again when he was staying with me one night. Uh, there were some bright lights outside the window. And uh, we, I say we were out in the country. And he swears that it was a craft that was there. And then on another occasion, he took a photograph of the full blood red moon. And on the photograph were five orbs. So I think once you open that veil, uh, of that expanded consciousness, then uh, they help, they assist. They don't give you too much information to blow your mind. It's just a little bit at a time to educate you as they've educated me, you know. So uh, I still think it's uh, exciting times ahead for us, uh, uh, Grant. Yeah, the, you mentioned the, the sort of spreads, like you, the, they talk about the hitchhiker effect, which happens, I think, with, with everything, that it sort of moves from one person to another and the it sort of expands out. What, what was your wife's reaction? Did she always sort of go along with this or did she sort of, we're just hearing your stories? And now she's sort of uh, come into it. Uh, how, how did she grow in this thing? Well, that's very interesting because initially I met, I met my wife. She was a technician at the university uh, at Leeds. We both worked there as technicians. And that's where I met yeah. her. And she, it, she'd she been reading some books. I think we were about 18 at the time. So the books by Eric von Daniken, believe it okay. or not. And she'd read them all. And, and uh, she said, Kevin, uh, you need to read these. They're very interesting. So I read them all as well. And then, but then when obviously we, we developed a relationship then and we went out and the usual things, uh, but then I was going to ask her to marry her. So asked me, ask her if I could marry her. And uh, she, uh, so I needed to tell her really that A, I'm able to see deceased family members. I'm able to speak to higher conscious beings and things. So I told her and she accepted it. And she said, well, if you can see ghosts, I want to see them as well. So, uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> so, so she, she's, grown, she's grown with it really. And, uh, you know, she's a very educated woman. She was the superintendent for uh, the psychology department at uh, Leeds University. Wow. So, she, you know, she's uh, a, an academic type and uh, uh, not prone to, uh, uh, BS, as she says, you know. So, uh, but now it, it's fascinating that they brought her into it because I couldn't do all this work that I do 
with, without her support. And she helped me with the computers because she's a, a whiz kid with computers and things. So, uh, uh, but, but fascinating that they do include her. On, I remember one occasion, we've got a large walk-in closet and uh, I heard her shouting me. She said, Kevin, come here. Come here. <laughs> and I, she said, have you done this? I said, do what? All the shoes had been lined up heel to toe along the baseboard, along the skirting board. So I said, no. And it was actually Zark. I asked him uh, why he'd done that. And uh, he said, well, to let her know that we're here, uh, it's important. But he said, I do like teasing her. Uh, I think it's funny. But the serious side is uh, the fact that we are here, we are amongst you. So, uh, And they do have a sense of humour, which is not usually spoken about. I remember the first time I was speaking with, not the first time, when I was speaking with Zark, the uh, small grey, and on this occasion, it was telepathic, but I could see him visually as well in my, in my mind. And uh, he was smiling. And I said something that was funny. And he smiled. But as he smiled, I felt the emotion of laughter. And I never had that with another being, feeling their emotion. And we don't tend to think of them as having emotions. Uh, but clearly they do. And so, clearly he's got a sense of humour because he, he uh, messes about with my wife's stuff, you know. So... Uh, uh, we need to expand that understanding that, you know, similar to us and Art and D look like us. Um, yeah. So you know, there's so many different facets to this. It's just uh, amazing it's all coming out now. And I feel quite privileged that I'm here to, to be able to witness it. And Zark is the, the, the name of the being. Is he a grey? He's a small guy. He's the mathematician. Oh, he's the mathematician. Uh, he's also okay. yeah, an engineer. He designs propulsion systems. He's got three offspring, and he's from the Pleiades system, he tells me. Okay, now, a qu question about that, because you know the UFO literature. What do we have to clear up in UFO literature? Because the majority of people will say, oh, the greys, they're the bad guys, they're here, you know, they're, they're just making babies, and they're up to no good. But you've encountered, which I think a lot of experiences have, is you've encountered sort of like the whole spectrum of beings, almost like they're working together. So wh what would you say to clear up people's impression about who we're dealing with, uh, you know, are, are the, are the, the greys bad guys or what's actually going on in terms of all the beings that are here? Okay, well, my understanding with the greys are they're one of the most uh, populated of beings within the universe and there's many different species of them. There are bad, bad greys, but the majority of them are here to help us. Uh, they're benevolent. So people don't need to be frightened of them. Um, but the, but I'll say there are the bad ones. I can give you a quick story. I was traveling outside of my body. I'd been uh, way out into the universe and coming back. I'm coming back between the moon and the earth. And I, I wouldn't say materialized, but I landed in a little cockpit, which has been flown by two greys. And they're transporting minerals from the earth to the moon. And they both look round at me behind them and say telepathically to one another, what's he doing here? And then I realized I shouldn't be there. So I said, I said I'm sorry, uh, forget it. Uh, I'm just on my way home and I, uh, I made a mistake, <laughs> bye. And I left, I went back home, I went back into my body. And when I woke up, there was a, a, a tall Dre with a large head stood at the side of my bed. And he said, I was not to interfere. Don't do that again. There will be repercussions. So it was a warning from them. So I don't know who they were. They weren't part of my usual group, but uh, um, but certainly they didn't like me interfering. And then after that, shortly after that, a, oh, what's called, a reptilian, and I've had no contact with the reptilians at all, uh, um, except for this one example. And he appeared uh, after, just after that tall grey left. He didn't speak to me. Uh, he was ambivalent to who I was. He was he, he was ambivalent to the human race. He, yeah. I could feel his... I, I knew what he was thinking. He didn't like us, but he wanted to know how a human being could travel out of body, travel and uh, materialise, as it were, within a craft uh, and then come back. So he came to find out how and why and who I was. Uh, and then he left. He never said anything, but uh, uh, that's my only contact with a reptilian. <laughs> he has fascinating fascinating stories uh you talked about the craft being conscious can you go a little bit into that and have you ever been allowed to fly the craft i've got i've got one better than that the i'd have to tell you the uh, leading up to it the time when um i explained the story 
when I was on the astral plane traveling and I went through the skin and it was conscious. Yeah. And uh, uh, that conversation. Uh, yeah. Oh, said to me then, why don't you travel further, Kevin? And I said, well, it's okay for you. I said, you've got a conscious craft here. You've got art to travel with a companion and you can go anywhere you want to go. And so he said to me, Kevin, why don't you create your own craft? And I said, well, how would I do that? How would I build a craft, a conscious craft like this? He said, using thought and consciousness. Wow. I said, oh, okay, okay. So um, that evening, uh, I was, a, uh, yeah, I think it was that evening. I thought, I'll try this. I'll see if I can uh, create a craft using thought and consciousness. So I relax. I think about this craft, this round craft, this conscious craft, and then uh, I leave my body. I'm in this craft, and I'm looking out through the window, and the, the what I thought was stars were flying past the window. And I thought, wow, I don't know where I'm going. I've no idea. Uh, I could get lost. So I, <laughs> I, see, I cease the experiment. But what I, I did find out later, they weren't stars. They were galaxies going past. So the following day, I, I organized it a little bit better. I thought, well, I need to know where I'm going. Uh, I need a slightly bigger craft. I need a bigger window if I want to see. So I'll create a larger craft, conscious, with a larger window, with a seat. I don't know why I need a seat because I'm traveling out of the body. And, uh, but, and I'll have a look at some star charts during the day. I'll go to Andromeda and I'll create a uh, mind interface navigation system. So where I think is where I go. Yeah. So I've designed it a little bit better now. It's better. I've got a larger seat for comfort, a lot of, I don't know why I need one, a bigger window, and I've got this uh, interface, uh, mind thought interface navigation system. So I set off and I go to, I thought I'll go and find them. I'll go find out where they are. So I went to Andromeda and uh, uh, I flew all over the place and I couldn't find anybody, but I did have a thought that I was flying around the planet in this conscious craft. Um, if I went down into the cloud base and below the cloud, would people see it as a UFO? I didn't get the answer to that, but I suspect so. It's just pure conscious energy traveling. And then, uh, anyway, I, I came back and uh, I, I went back into my body, as it were. I stopped the experiment, the traveling about. And then all eight of the Council of Eight appeared in the bedroom looking down at me. And I said, oh, I've just been out looking for you. I've been all over the place in this craft. And they said, yes, we know, that's why we're here. <laughs> and, and I asked them to explain. They also showed me a large mothership in the bedroom. And I said, look, I don't understand. How can all eight of you be in my bedroom with a mothership at the same time? And they, they went on to explain about space, time, and dimension. But unfortunately, I didn't understand it. But in relation, you asked, have I been allowed to fly a craft? They've taken me one step further in allowing me to create my own conscious craft. Um, so, what, I think what's really happened, they've developed me to the same levels and abilities that Orton D have, who are fifth dimensional beings. And, and if I can do it, just a, a regular uh, person, as it were, then we can all have these abilities. We just need to teach them to one another and practice them. And, uh, uh, and that's part of our evolution, I believe in relation to raising that vibrational consciousness to join the galactic families. That's what we need to do. And that's where we're heading. It's our natural evolution, but we're being assisted as grandparents uh, teach their children. It's no different. Our uncles and aunts teach their children. I think it's no different to that really, uh, but we have to be open-minded to it. Uh, uh, but there are, I speak to many now, and uh, there are many, many working towards this on all different facets. So uh, I think I find it just just fascinating, really, and exciting, as I say. You mentioned uh, consciousness, I think. So let's go into consciousness about is is this the primary force? Is everything made out of consciousness? For because there'll be some people who will be watching this who really haven't caught on to this idea that that consciousness is very key to the UFO thing. So. Can you define consciousness and how does it fit into reality? Uh, what's your understanding of reality? Maybe even through your downloads that they've been giving you. Okay. Uh, my, my understanding would be that we, the universe itself is conscious. Uh, 
and conscious energy is the life force of the universe, the life force of all life. But conscious energy can be used for creation. So we create the physical body and then we create the physical world that we, we appear in. We are creating that. Conscious energy is light. It's a, it's, say lives, it lives at say the quantum level as pure light between the space, between the subatomic particles. So everything is connected. We live in a sea of conscious energy. and We're part of that by manifesting the physical and the reality. That's why we can co-create now because we've reached this level of consciousness and understanding. We can communicate with our ET star families and create the future that we desire for our children, for our future generations. And we can create that society that will, with our ET star families, that will include them. And that's where we're heading now, because that's why we're speaking about it, because we are creating it. We are co-creating it using thought and consciousness. Does that make sense? Yes. You, you've done this for 57 years. Have you seen a change from when you first started to the understanding that we have now in terms of how, how this is working and what's actually going on? Uh, yes, without, without a doubt. Our scientists are slowly catching up. But, but the, the other side of the... Um, we've got the side of the, the UFOs, the ETs, the nuts and bolts side. But it's not about them. It's about us as humanity. It's about our spirituality, about who we are. We are spiritual beings. We are conscious energy light beings having a physical experience. And once we learn that and we understand that, then it will change our whole concept. But we have to know that globally. And all our indigenous peoples, they've known that. That's part of their culture. We have lost it all. Our scientists have lost it. And we, as the human species, need to get that, relearn that information in relation to conscious energy. Uh, oneness and love is sometimes, I think the free survey showed 54% of people have been talked to about oneness and love. Did they go through that? And what's your, what's your take on the importance of those two principles in terms of what they're doing here? Yes, I, I would agree. Uh, the love is one of the highest vibrational frequencies. Okay. Uh, so if we can do that, then we are raising our own level of frequency. And then, yeah, we are all connected to consciousness. So we're connected to the trees, the plants, the insects, the rocks, the earth itself. And I can give you a quick example. My brother's a, a retired uh, aircraft engineer. And uh, he, uh, he retired down to Spain. And he'd been in Spain about a year and he lives, he's rented a place overlooking the Mediterranean. And I speak to him most days. And he said, oh, Kevin, you should see the butterflies down here in Spain. They're huge, absolutely huge. I said, oh, uh, I said, well, why don't you uh, <clears throat> ask them to come and land on your hands so you can have a, have a look at them closely and have a look at the colours? He said, oh, well, they won't do that. Bearing in mind, he's an engineer. Yeah. I said, well, go out onto the uh, uh, balcony. And uh, I said, hold your hand out. And I'm watching because I'm talking to him on the phone, iPhone. And uh, so he held his hand out. The butterfly flew past. I said, right, you've got to give it a reason. Tell it you want it to land on your hand because you want to look at its beautiful colours. On the on his fingers, on the on the wings, sorry. Yeah. So it flew past, it went outside, turned around, came back, and landed on his fingers. And I've got photographs of it. <laughs> I said, right. Now, I said, right, now this is a connection of consciousness that we have. I said, right now, I said, tell it to go away and come back with a friend because you want to compare the colours on the friend's wings. So it took off, it went outside, it came back with a friend, the original one landed on his fingers, and the second one landed on his forehead like that. So he, comp he now identifies them by the wings. So on that, on that day, uh, I don't know, it was 12 different butterflies, but he had um, 12 landings of butterflies on him. Bearing in mind he'd been there for a year and he's just been watching them fly past. So he got that communication using consciousness as a conduit because they have, they, they have an understanding of that. So what had happened is he was able to communicate with using thought and consciousness. But then he was out there with his wife and on the balcony. He said, oh, uh, 
hold your hand out. We'll ask the butterflies to come land on you. And the butterflies came and landed on his wife. And I got photographs of that. <laughs> but but that, that's a rudimentary understanding of communicating with the insect world. So if we can expand on that knowledge, we can interact with uh, the higher levels of consciousness, even up to the level where consciousness doesn't have a physical uh, we can communicate up to those higher realms of what we call the, the angelic realms, the higher dimensions. And, and, and really, we have to understand that we are multidimensional beings ourselves. Just all this information has been hidden from us, has been denied us. Uh, and now we are, we are beginning to, to learn it. So uh, um, it's, but if my brother, my brother's, again, he changed his perception of who he is in relation to where he is and why he's here. And, uh, and I tell that story because uh, he's still fascinated and he still asks the butterflies to come and land on him and they do at request. <laughs> and so it's, uh, and they say coming from a, it's a bit like my friend who didn't believe in the ETs. They just have to see something to experience it. Then it expands their understanding of consciousness. Then what I believe is, say me and you, Grant, who have a grasp of understanding consciousness, if we go out into a group, part of that conscious energy is shared with that group just by being there. And I believe that's the important part as well. That's why we need to mix with people. We don't need to be separated. We need, to, because when we get close to people, we can share their conscious energy, their auras, as some people describe them. Wow. Fascinating. Have they given you any uh, warnings? Sometimes you'll hear about they want us to hurry up, that we have to shift the, you know, the consciousness. Have they given you any sort of warnings about uh, timelines or the fact that we're sort of messing things up here in, in terms of the ecology? Yeah, they're, they're very concerned about uh, what the pollution uh, on planet Earth. Okay. They're particularly concerned about the pollution from the Fukushima plant in Japan. Uh, they, they say that they have technologies that will uh, able to clean that up. Uh, but first they need to be invited here. They need to be invited by the citizens of earth. They've tried contacting our governments and our governments are ignoring them. So now the, what they call the reveal will come from the citizens from the people of earth who will invite them here. And that's what I'm working towards now at the moment. They tell me that they want a, uh, they need a mandated protocol to be implemented to receive them. So they are protected on approach to our planet, protected while they're flying in our atmosphere and protected while they're landing and meeting with us. So I've been working with uh, other people to try and get one of these implemented. Now, whether we could get it implemented with the government or not, I've contacted the Outer Space Affairs Committee on a, a few occasions, and I've got an interesting story with that if you've got time. Yes, yes, go um, ahead, yeah. I forgot you, I, it, I heard you talk about this, so go ahead, yeah. Okay, but if, um, but what I suspect now is, okay, I now have a, a good copy of a mandated protocol from a guy called Sylvain Roshan. He sent me it the other day and it fits everything that my ETs are requesting. Okay. So now what we need to do is get people to sign this. And then if we get enough citizens of earth, we can request they come and meet with us because we, the citizens have signed a mandated protocol. And if our governments want to join in, then they can do, they're quite welcome to but it will come from the citizens. So that's what I'm working on now in relation to that. But I was asked um, well, a while ago, I was given some telepathic information uh, to contact the Outer Space, Out, Outer Space Affairs Committee. And I contacted the office of Nicholas Hedman, he was a chairman, and asked him about this mandated protocol. Do we have one? How do we get one? And he, he, they did respond. They said, no, we don't have one at the moment. You would have to get a, a United Nations member to uh, propose one and then it will be voted on. So uh, um, anyway, about 12 months later, I, got, I was asked again to contact the uh, United Nations, the Outer Space Affairs Committee. And uh, I got some information in relation to a Dr. 
Depot in Washington, D.C. So I sent him the emails as well with the same request as I sent to Nicholas Hedman and I sent them to both officers. But after I'd sent them about 10 days later, Terry Lovelace contacted me and he said he wanted to speak with me. So I, uh, and as you know, Terry's a retired yeah. assistant district attorney, a retired yeah. law professor, and his, and, and he's a lifelong experiencer as well. And uh, his ET guide had given him the exact same information wow. that I'd been given in relation to this mandated protocol. So uh, he said, <laughs> Kevin, I, so I told him that I'd already written to Nicholas Hedman in uh, the UN in Vienna and, uh, and Dr. De Pippo in Washington, D.C., in the office there. And he said, well, I know uh, Dr. De Pippo. I will send him an email as well, supporting what you're saying, because my ET guys <clears throat> have given me the same information. So he did that. And I've got copies of all these emails. And uh, he did that. Neither of us received a reply from the office in Washington. I had replies in the past from... Uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Nicholas Hedman's office in Vienna. Um, but on this occasion, I just got the standard reply. We have received your, an automated reply. We have received your email. And then I know that uh, um, Terry Lovelace went through the back channels from the, from his uh, experience that he's had working within government and he got, he got the pushback. So they're not ready yet. They don't want it. So, uh, and there are many, uh, of us working towards this now. It's not just me, uh, there are lots of people. And again, I was introduced to Sylvain because that's what I was looking for. And I was trying to find a, a, a mandated protocol we could use or perhaps we could get one drafted up possibly. And he's already got one. But I was introduced by another experiencer to him. I contacted him, told him what I'm looking for. So we were connected now. So the, the next stage within that is get people to uh, sign it or even just be aware of it to read it or something so we have we're increasing that level of conscious understanding that the ets are here but like with any ambassadors if we invite someone from a foreign country we need to protect them while they're here so they're not unreasonable requests and i've been at conferences where uh, i personally have asked them to show a craft along with two other people uh, on that one occasion, it was Amanda Bosman and oh, I forget his name now, David. And uh, uh, we asked the, a craft to appear, and it, a craft appeared uh, uh, above the conference for one hour, 20 minutes. And then later on in the day, uh, David, uh, Amanda, and myself went out. Uh, it, it was, it was going, getting on late, about midnight, I think. And we went out uh, and asked them to show three crafts from the three different ETs or groups of ETs that we each contact with. But after about 10 minutes, nothing happened, so I left. Two minutes after I left, three craft appeared. So we have the ability to uh, ask them to appear. We have, there are many people that have telepathic communication direct with their own ETs. So um, between experiences, uh, we've got a great deal of contact. We are the ambassadors, I believe, in relation to bridge that gap uh, between uh, the citizens of Earth and the higher conscious beings, the ETs, who are willing to come here and share their knowledge with us and expand our understanding. But it has to come now from the citizens of Earth. So that's where, where, where we're heading. And we have to do that because if we don't, we're on a path of annihilation. We're on a path of destruction. Uh, and that's where we'll end up. And I said they are very concerned about this nuclear nuclear pollution and everything. So, and they are they do tell me they would. I asked them, why don't you just intervene? And they said we can't do that. I don't know whether they've got protocols themselves. He, he said that we have to be invited as guests. And uh, so, but once they are invited and we get together, then they're happy to share technologies and things with us. So. Do you, do you think they would stop a nuclear exchange if, if, if? They've already said that. They said the only time that they would interfere is if we use nuclear weapons, then they would interfere. And our governments know that uh, uh, in relation to, uh, they've activated our nuclear weapons, uh, they've uh, deactivated our nuclear weapons. Yeah. They've even shot them down when they've been testing uh, a new ones. And uh, so our governments know the capabilities of the higher conscious beings, yeah. the ET star families. So, uh, you know, they could just turn off all the nuclear weapons. So yeah, they will intervene. They don't want us to destroy ourselves. 
They say we've reached this level of technology in the past and destroyed ourselves. They don't want it to happen again. So, uh, yeah. so they are here. They are serious. Uh, they do want to assist with that evolution. And I say just by speaking about it, Grant, uh, that uh, raises the vibrational frequency. Uh, a story you may have heard me tell, I don't know. Uh, the Canadian government worked on this, uh, Wilbert Brockhaus Smith from 1950 to 1954. He had contact, he was a contactee and experiencer, and he had a contact with an alien by the name of AFA. And according to the story I heard, AFA had said, uh, we will, the only time we will ever interfere, exactly what you're saying, is if there is a nuclear exchange, we could take the moon in front of the entire world, split it in half and put it back together to prove that we can do it. Other than that, we will allow the human race to stew in its own juices. So it's basically yeah. the same sort of message as you're getting That's is right. that they can interfere, that if we want to commit suicide, well, there's not much they can do about it, but you're not going to contaminate, you're not going to destroy the world and leave it unlivable for the next 50,000 yes, years. Because don't forget, there are uh, bases here, ET bases on the Earth, in the Earth. Yeah. Uh, it's their planet as well, but we don't see them because they... They don't allow us to see them, but yeah, they are here. They, they are monsters, and uh, and that's why <laughs> you know you can you can ask them to. I mean, I was speaking the other day to uh, oh, by uh, text or whatever to Costa McCreese. He's oh, yeah. got the ET ET Let's Talk group, yeah. and he tells me now I think that there's uh, over a billion people now uh, on the Earth going out and making uh, communication contact. Okay, it's basic, it's telepathic. It's putting the love out there. It's asking telepathically and the craft will show and it'll the flare up and come down again. But that's a basic communication. But it shows we've got over a billion people now on Earth who are wanting to hold, hold out that hand to our ETs. And, uh, and people like myself and others, and I'm sure Rebecca Harcastle and Ray Hernandez, and uh, there are many leaders of the different groups uh, who are reaching out and have that uh, direct uh, uh, contact. So... Uh, in fact, I remember remember uh, another example with Rebecca. I was given some information to uh, share with eight different people. I, I can't remember what it is now. I wrote it down. So I, I emailed all these eight people with the information. And then uh, about oh, 20 minutes later, Rebecca phones me. And uh, I said, oh, she doesn't phone me that often. You know, maybe once a year or whatever, or we communicate by email. I said, oh, have you read my email? She says, no, I haven't read the email. What email is that? I said, oh, well, why are you calling me? She said, well, she'd been dropping some family members off at school, college or university or something. And she received a telepathic message to contact me immediately because I'd got some important information from her. So, <laughs> that, 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 so that's why she's calling me. So that shows the, the fact that they are communicating with the same people. And uh, I met another lady who was a friend of... Uh, uh, Kathy Marden, and uh, she was handed a copy of my book, and she opened up the book. She got an urge to open it at the back, saw these sketches that my wife do of Art and Dee, and she said to us, I've met these two people, I know them, I need to speak to Kevin. So wow. she got in touch via Kathy again, that link, uh, wow. and we, we she invited us down to uh, her home for an afternoon lunch and barbecue, and uh, we compared notes, and I showed you some of my notes there. Her notes were just as thick, and uh, uh, there was information that I was able to give her that identified it was Orton D she'd been speaking to, and she'd been given, uh, we, we talked about the matrix surrounding the earth. I've been shown the matrix from this side and uh, both sides, and uh, she said, oh, I, she said, have you, have you been shown the matrix? I said, yes, I have. So I then said to her, have you been shown it from both sides? She said, yes, I have. <laughs> and then uh, we, we compared the notes, and they're almost identical. So they, but she doesn't speak out as much as I do. Uh, I probably speak out. As, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to speak it out. Define the matrix. For, can you define the matrix for people who may not understand that concept? Okay. Well, my understanding would be uh, if you think of it as a grid around the Earth, and each one of the uh, grid is hexagonal in shape, like a beehive, a honey hive. But my understanding is I believe that that grid stops us leaving um, the physical and expanding outside as we are multidimensional beings. And okay. I think that's what the term when they call, we have a prison planet, but we're a prison planet 
because we're not allowed our true knowledge and understanding of who we are. And that um, uh, grid, as some people call it, matrix, keeps us in place. Wow, Fasc fascinating. Uh, I I'm willing to help you out with this. Uh, if you've got a link for people who might want to sign uh, to support your, your initiative or... Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to get in touch with uh, Sylvain because it, okay. it's his, uh, it's his um, uh, mandate, but we've already spoken about it uh, in relation to he's happy to go ahead and do that. He sent me the copy and uh, uh, we did some alterations on it. So we're, we're in the next stage. So when I get that, I'll, I'll send it over to you because if we can share that document with all the people who are involved in this, and if we could maybe just get a million people, uh, but then he, um, Sylvain was saying within his group, if they get a million people to sign this and we present it to the United Nations, then they may listen and he's got direct contact with people in high levels of the UN. But he said without uh, information or uh, pushing from the people, they won't do anything. They're not interested again. So, But I think it, it's a, a double-edged sword. We can give it to them as well, but we, the citizens of Earth, we have the... Uh, understanding and there are many of us who can uh, call the cast in and uh, we can even uh, arrange a meeting i'm sure but we have to do it uh, collectively as a, a species as the citizens of earth fascinating discussion kevin absolutely fascinating i've, I've been honored to uh have have spent this time with you well what are you working on now what, what what are you thinking of maybe another uh book in terms of the notes you have or what are you what are you planning to do uh well ray hernandez asked me to be a contributor to his his new book a greater oh, yeah. reality that's coming out this year i think there's four volumes each with 800 pages i'm sure what might be mentioning it and uh four uh, volumes Four volumes. The first two <laughs> will be all the leading scientists who are describing the phenomena that we have uh, in relation to our understanding of it. And then the second two volumes will be experiences like myself uh, telling their stories. So really it's bringing the scientists together with the experiences to share that knowledge. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit similar to me being able to design a, a a mind thought interface navigation system just by thought. I mean, that's really way out there. But um, if our scientists can get together with the experiences and share that knowledge and expand their knowledge, then that will help us develop as well to become a true spacefaring species as the others have done and, and still continue to do so. Wow. And then I think he's, he's got a documentary as well uh, on uh, to run alongside that. I think it's just about finished now. And uh, I was, uh, I'm, I will be part of that. And um, I've filmed, a, um, I'm able to channel the Council of Eight. They will speak directly through me. And, and there's a channel within that documentary, which I think will be uh, quite important. And uh, I did it with Cathy Martin, Denise Stoner, and Dr. Melanie Barton, and we recorded it at her house. So there's quite a lot coming out this year in relation to, so, so I've been working uh, a little bit on that and so a couple of other things. Uh, I did a, an essay and I'm, I'm gonna publish that possibly in relation to consciousness. So uh, I'm just working on things as they come along and very often what will happen, I'll get to a point and then they'll ask me to do something else. They'll give me some more information or they'll give me a contact point and that leads to some more work to do. So. Uh, but uh, I've got plenty to do this year anyway. Grant, so <laughs> so, so uh, you, you see, you can channel them sort of at will. Would, what would be their main message that they were putting out, like, say, to, to the audience today? What would be the, the message that you think that they would want people to, to know? Uh, that they are here to assist in our evolution, not to fear them. And um, I know Kathy's got a new, Kathy Martin's got a new book coming out. Uh, this uh, year with transcripts from some of the channels that we did. Uh, again, I was I was asked by Art a few years ago to go down to a MUFON meeting in Orlando. There was a conference and I wasn't interested in going. I wasn't interested in the nuts and bolts of it all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
but I, I went because they asked me to go. And I remember driving down there. I said, uh, you know, I don't really want to go here. I'm not interested. But uh, if I'm going, I want to meet people that uh, uh, can help me, assist me with my journey. So I went. I just went for the one day and uh, I met Denise Stoner. And then Kathy Martin was one of the speakers. And then it was lunchtime. And I was surprised at how many people were there. And I was also surprised by the calibre of people there. A lot of engineers, a lot of scientists. And uh, I went to the, have the lunch at lunchtime and I went to the cafeteria area and it was absolutely packed. There was, wasn't a seat anywhere. I bought myself a sandwich and then I spotted a seat, just one seat on a table uh, with the two of the ladies that were sat there. So I walked up and said, OK, if I sit down and uh, eat my sandwich, I said, yeah, they were chatting away, chatting away. And then they finished chatting and then I was brought into the conversation. Um, one of those ladies was Dr. Melanie Batten. And she was a person who I was there to meet. I didn't know that at the time. But through uh, Dr. Melanie Barton, Denise Stoner, I met with Kathy Martin. And then what we did, uh, Kathy invited me around to her home uh, with uh, Denise and Melanie. And accidentally, I started channeling. And I wasn't aware that I was channeling. They picked up on that. And then what we did, we met once a month at my home and channeled. Uh, and it was all transcribed. And a lot of that is coming out in Kathy Marden's new book. I don't know what the title is of it yet, but uh, oh. so that'll be quite interesting. So if that comes out in uh, conjunction with Ray's book, uh, Ray's documentary, I say there's all these people doing all this tremendous work. And you know, Costa McCrease with his uh, ET Let's uh, e, um, Talk.com. Talk, yeah. I mean, it's just, and they've been doing it for years. I've just come into this at the last minute, as it were. So <laughs> they're, they're the champions. They're the, the soldiers that have been doing this for, for all this period of time. But, but it's culminating in now the experiences speaking out, the experiences coming together, and some of the experiences who have been reluctant to come out in the past, um, where now they're, they're able to. Um, and again, I think that's because people like myself and others who are speaking out, it's, it, you're not been, I haven't had any ridicule as yet, um, but I speak confidently. Yeah. I can answer any questions uh, and I have the knowledge that they've given me. And if I need to, I can call on them to, uh, to come in and help and assist, you know. So uh, uh, I've, uh, I've no problems with that at all. So we'll wait and see. But again, I think 2022, is going to be uh, the year for the reveal. I haven't been given a date yet. They did give me a date a couple of years ago. I think it was February the 1st sometime. And that was the date that uh, um, Terry Lovelace got as well from his. And we worked on it, we worked towards it, but it didn't happen because the government didn't want it to happen. So, so now they've changed tack and we're going to go through the citizens of Earth. So, uh, and I say there's there's many work, and I'm only part in this. I'm just that small piece, of that jigsaw, with some extra bit of information. That's all. Well, I, I will definitely help you where I can. One other question I'd like to or um, suggestion I'd like to ask you: If I'm having a panel on people who do out of body experience in connection with this, and I've run up against four or five in a row. Would you be interested in doing a panel where we go live on the internet and people can do questions and you can talk? Because I think this is something that I think a lot of people, if they're in the nuts and bolts, they think it's, you know, aliens grabbing people out of their beds and hauling them out and stuff like that. And they don't realize this sort of spiritual or uh, uh, astral aspect to this phenomena. So I want to bring a bunch of people and you're one of the ones that, that, that does this. Uh, to explain to people that this is a lot of what's going on and that if we can understand that. Now, the government even was doing this. Uh, they were using with the remote viewing program with uh, Joe McMonagall, they were using him in a, an out-of-body experience state to, to spy on Russia and, and China and stuff like that. So they've known for many years that you could go outside your body and do this kind of stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that I think that is missing when we do our disclosure thing. It's, it's one thing to say, We've got crafts and they're here or whatever. But the message that you and I and other people are putting out is it's way more than that. There's there's something very sort of spiritual and very uh, mystical going on here as well. And that's the message that they want. They're, uh, you know, it doesn't really help us to have, have more toys or faster crafts or whatever. We need to to understand the more important reason why they're here and what they're trying to teach us. 
Yes, I, I would agree entirely. It is about us. It's not about the nuts and bolts of the UFOs and ETs and the, all their technologies. It's about us, our evolution, our spiritual evolution, which we've lost. I mean, they still have it in the uh, in the East, in China and uh, uh, places like that, India. But, yeah. but we've lost ours. The Western world's lost it co completely. So we need to get that back and we need to uh, expand our knowledge and understanding that we are much more than the physical body. And once we realise that, then, I mean, communicating for me on all these different levels is just normal. It's just who I am. Well, uh, I'm sure there's many others like that. And uh, the more that we can get to that level, the easier it will be for we as a species, human species, uh, to evolve. Well, thank you for what you do. You encourage me when I run up against people like you, I realize we, we actually have a team here and there are other people who figure who figured this thing out. Because I have my experience, you had your experience, you came to the same conclusion I came, going down a different path than I did. And when you realize there are other people, it gives you hope and support that what you're doing is right. So I really appreciate what you've done and that you're stepping up. Show your book uh, uh, one more time, your two books, and then uh, we'll shut it down and I will give you a contact. So this is a spiritual consciousness, a personal journey. And yeah. that's uh, how, how many years old is that? They're on Amazon if you want to get them on yeah. Amazon. Yeah. That's the best way to get them. And then the second one, that's got the picture of the rainbow and the UFO that my wife took. Wow. I've got some, some other uh, filtered one now of it. And uh, although it's cloaked, you can see it's in a cloak because the person that did it for me, he, he did a couple of filters on it and it's uh, amazing. But I, th I think that's coming out somewhere. I can't remember where now, but it's been published somewhere. So, uh, oh, I know it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to publish something later on this year. And that picture with the filtered. And the story of the rainbow and communicating with my wife wow. while I'm speaking telepathically will be in, in that book. And I'm, I'm going to co-author that with a friend of mine. Uh, we're talking about uh, um, life after death, as it were, or continued life, as it were. So, uh, uh, so hopefully that will come out this year sometime. Beautiful. Thank you, Kevin. It's been, it's been an honor and a, ple and a pleasure to speak to you. And let's do it again. I'll, I'll send you an email and you give me a link and give me this... Uh, this mandate and um, I'm going to help you move this thing along. I've got a lot of contacts over the years and a lot of people who would uh, jump in and help you do this. So let's, uh, and that's all we can okay. really do is we can, we, we can't solve, maybe save the world, but we can do what we can do. That's all they expect us to do. Do what you can with what you, the talents you've been given. And you and I have been given more than most people. It's like, I always say, like the Bible says too much is given much is expected. So you and I have been given stuff. And it's up to us to not keep it to ourselves and to share it and to try to help others with it. So I, I yeah, well, it. well, again, I'd like to thank you, Grant, because without people like you uh, interviewing people like me, we wouldn't get the message out there. So it's yeah. uh, it's a, a, a joint work. We're all collaborating, coming, collaborating yeah. and coming together now. So that's that's the key, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, the, 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 the expression is we are the ones we've been waiting for. So thank you for <laughs> thank you for for talking to me, and we'll talk again soon. And I'd love to have you back on, but definitely with this OBE panel, and um, we'll we'll follow up and uh, keep the message going. Thank you. Okay, sounds like a fun. Thank you, okay. Grant. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good day.